Well, good evening. It's, uh, what is it? It's uh, December the 12th. So it's Saturday, it's December the 12th. It's just after quarter past seven in the evening. And I'm here for an hour with um, Alex Thompson. And we're going to be talking essentially about the use of applied behavioral psychology. And why have we gone on to this topic? Well, we've got on to it because it's clear to us that uh, this is a tool that's being used to quite significant effect by the British government. And it's a particularly uh, devious tool because of course uh, its application can't be determined by a lot of the general public, even though the documentation exists showing that this is a real, um, a real uh, capability of the government. And um, we've got some powerful people within government and the government arena who've been uh, openly talking about the use of applied behavioural psychology. And I'll start off by saying that as we, as we move through this uh, dialogue tonight, uh, we will be inserting material into the final recorded version so that people will be able to see what we're talking about. Um, but we are going to try and draw in as, as much factual documentary evidence as we can to show exactly what we're talking about and why we think the public needs to know. So Alex, um, first of all, to welcome you on board. Thank you very much for joining me tonight. Thank you, Brian. Uh, pleasure to be with you. And I think this is going to be rather wide ranging and pretty deep as far as our dives go, because it's de deception wrapped within deceit on top of smoke screens, I would say, what's going on here. Uh, but we, we do have to get to the bottom of it as best we can. Indeed we do. Um, well, where should we start? I, I think actually that uh, I'm going to change my original plan because uh, a key document for me um, came, out of, came out of a book um, called the European Union Collective, Enemy of Its Member States. And this was a book written by a gentleman called Christopher Storey. I read it many years ago. <clears throat> Excuse me, if I have to guess, I would say it would be about mm, probably 18 years ago or something like that. Uh, <clears throat> and um, uh, the book itself was a very detailed look at European politics with a particular focus on Germany and Russia. Um, but what caught my eye was that within the first few pages of that document, uh, Christopher's story had inserted a table and the table was called the National Desta Destabilization Plan of KGB GRU based on Soviet defector intelligence. And um, if I just, uh, on my screen anyway, just scroll down to the bottom of that uh, document, uh, what Christopher's story said was this, the national revolutionary subversion process based on details revealed by the Soviet defector, Yuri Bezmenov, also known as Thomas Schumann, using his own knowledge of KGB strategy and details conveyed to John Barron, the author of KGB, The Secret Work of Soviet Secret Agents, 1974, and KGB Today, The Hidden Hand, uh, 1983, uh, by the GRU KGB officer, Stanislav Levchenko. And it says that particular gentleman had attended the Soviet Academy of Leninist Science Oriental Studies Institute with Bezmenov. Now, what interested me about this table was that it purported to be how a psychological attack was going to be carried out on societies in the West. I sat, I can still remember the day, with a cup of tea, and I read through that, uh, uh, that particular um, template. And as I read each line, I thought, my goodness, this is happening. We are witnessing this taking place in the UK. Now I'm, I'm guessing, I'm saying 18 years ago, maybe it was 15, but um, we've now got a lot more documentation where we can add to this. But first of all, Alex, what, what is your take on this initial table by Christopher Story, which is talking about demoralization? 
This is coming principally from the Soviet defector who went by the German name of Thomas Schumann, but his own name is Yuri Bizmenov. And under that latter name, he has taken on a new lease of life in popular culture in recent years as clips of him speaking on 1980s VHS cassette to American audiences about the attack on their morals have become popular and have become an internet meme. Soviet defectors is a really, really tricky and complicated area to assess properly. As a former GCHQ officer uh, with expertise on the former Soviet Union, I would not like to overstate my expertise here. Uh, just by way of laying out those credentials, I'm one of the few hundred people in Britain who has been on the inside at the highest level of clearance on assessing what Soviet defectors say, but I'm quick to add I was on the signals intelligence side, so I don't have the first-hand experience that MI6 officers would have had. But I do know enough and have rubbed shoulders with the Russia defector handlers uh, of the 2000s and their previous expertise stretching back into the late Cold War to know that there is a massive struggle between different schools of Soviet defectors and other Eastern Bloc defectors as to the narrative to be cast and the warning to be given to the West. And defectors are about three or four iterations of complicated men, and they almost always are men by the way, uh, because they are tortured souls on top of being in a high rank usually of a very deceptive and deceitful organization inside a totalitarian regime. Often defectors can't stand each other and when they come to Britain or America, the countries they have usually ended up in, uh, they will be at each other's throats, at least behind the scenes. What sets Bizmenov apart and one in particular uh, who preceded him, as we say the granddaddy of Soviet defectors, Anatoly Golitsyn, both of whom uh, were rated very highly by Christopher Story, the writer of this book you've mentioned. What sets them apart is that they had sufficient expertise, at least in their own claims, which I think are well vouched for, to say in the strategic planning of the KGB, that was uh, Golitsyn's speciality and department, and in the propaganda efforts of the KGB, that was Bezmenov's speciality, this is the long-term agenda. Since then, and as warned by Golitsyn after his defection in the very early 1960s, the first big hitting defector from the USSR, and as warned by him, there have been a series of other defectors of questionable quality and veracity, uh, such as Oleg Gordievsky and others, uh, who's more of a favourite of MI6, uh, whom I've he heard speak many times or several times uh, both to public audiences and semi-private and also to intelligence officers only spinning different versions of his yarn every time he's clearly on a lead or, or telling us what we want to hear uh, in the west Golitsyn and Bizmenov Golitsyn by the way uh, was in hiding for the rest of his life he was one of several uh, KGB and GRU defectors who never had the death sentence against them rescinded by post-communist Russia and Romania Golitsyn went into hiding and said uh, really, there is such a, a plan uh, to subvert you all that you wouldn't believe it. It's the reason why the Soviet Union was called into being in the first place. Bezmenov gave a little more cultural detail than that. He was a later defector, but in the same strand of thinking as Bezmenov. Golitsyn wrote two books which were very accurate in their predictions. The first was called New Lies for Old, actually written in 1980, not published until a few years later. and many other things, very many uh, predictions, almost 200 predictions, in fact, in the book New Lies for Old, uh, all but nine of which have verifiably come true, which clearly did come true. They weren't just bald assertions like those of other defectors. One could go further down this rabbit hole and talk about other defectors, but it's a lot to take on board for people at the start, so I'll just hand over to you for a moment to say uh, what you have seen from your time, because, of course, you fought the end of the Cold War in the Royal Navy. And saw something of this as well. Well that's that's a very good point um, Alex because I was relatively recently retired from the Royal Navy. The bulk of my time was was spent with um, in the Royal Navy during the Cold War period so I was very much in the in the mindset that of course the uh, the Russians and the Eastern Bloc were absolutely the enemy. We we were always warned in um, military documents that we were looking at about 
potential subversive attacks by Russia on, on the Western powers. And therefore, for me to read this book of Christopher's story, which has a huge amount of uh, political detail, a lot of footnotes in it. Um, but when I, when I read it the first time, it fitted what I will call my mindset at that time, in that I was very much looking at uh, Russia, the former Soviet Union, as being the hostile power, um, ready to sort of leap on the back of the um, free democracies in Western Europe. I certainly don't hold that simplistic viewpoint anymore. Um, but um, Alex, something you mentioned there, which I think we, we could just focus on a little bit, is um, you, you used the expression um, uh, that it was this, it, <clears throat> this was the sort of plan and it was the reason why the Soviet Union came into being. Now, I think that's a very important statement because um, having read this book and looked at the table all those years ago, thinking, yes, this fits the Soviet picture, uh, I've moved on now, of course, to the stage where I'm thinking, well, actually, how was the Soviet Union itself created and what sorts of, of um, dirty tricks were unleashed on Russia in order to produce that state? So. I don't know whether you'd like to just comment on that. What what do, what do you really mean by, uh, or what did this gentleman mean by the fact that it was the reason the Soviet Union came into being? Perhaps the best single book for people to read on that is one of Golitsyn's two books. Uh, I mentioned the the first of them already, uh, New Lies for Old, written uh, before. Uh, detente actually in the 90, early 1980s. The second of them is the one I'd recommend to start answering that, The Perestroika Deception, written in the late 80s and early 90s, and about that period itself and about Gorbachev's position. And uh, at this point, Christopher Story, the, the author of the book you're quoting from which this table is taken, the book called The European Union Collective, colon, mem Enemy of Its Member States, Story was sought out by Anatoly Golitsyn. So that's not the man credited at the bottom of this page with the table in it. That's Piers Menov, the cultural specialist, the propaganda specialist. But Golitsyn, the strategist who defected 20 years prior to that, uh, is the one uh, who'd first uh, warned about this. And he handed Christopher Story as an Englishman whom he trusted, who was an economic advisor to Thatcher and Kremlinologist, and said, Mr. Story, I'm in hiding. I can't really meet you, but you, you are the man to get this out. And unlike the breathless accounts often told, I think this one does stack up and a story like Golitsyn has been borne out. Now, the usual way, uh, it's usually quite an anti-Semitic uh, ca uh, camp that brings out this story. The usual way that this story is told in the West by skeptics about the Soviet Union is to go to the very early 1900s in the city of London and more particularly New York. Uh, J.P. Morgan and especially the banks uh, Kuhn, Loeb and Co. and Schiff and to look at how Trotsky and Lenin were wined and dined and fated there in New York before being sent uh, via, of course, the famous sealed train out of Zurich uh, via, through the German uh, Reich in the First World War to the Soviet Union. That is part of the story, and people will go awry if they think it was all Jewish bankers there. That's a small part, I think, of what's going on. If we take it through the Lenin goggles themselves, and if we listen to Golitsyn and Bismenov, who say it's all based on Lenin's uniquely and satanically deceptive thinking about how to take over the world, then we get more wisdom. This is what Gorbachev, Yeltsin, Putin, in their own ways, have said since. And I'm not saying they're all on the same page or that they've all stuck to the same agenda throughout their careers. They haven't. Um, they'll perhaps get to that later. But what the latter Soviet and Russian leaders all said is Lenin gave us a strategy for world domination, which we must adapt to the times. And if you follow that, you see that the whole 20th century, the uh, Communist Party of Russia and then the Soviet Union and then Russia again, the Communist Party exists through that whole century before, during and after communist rule. And it has only four grand strategies. The first is before the abortive re revolution of 1905. The second is after the Soviet's revolution, the Bolshevik revolution, and that lasts a full 40, 50 years through the Second World War, through Stalinism and the reversal, partial st reversal of Stalinism by uh, Khrushchev. And then it comes, 1959 to 1960. This is, I think, the crown jewels of Golitsyn and Story's attestation. Then the third strategic direction of Soviet communism comes in, and it's the one that indicates to us 
that it was Western based or international globalist, and I'm not using that simply as cover for Jews, I think it's largely Gentiles involved in this, uh, breaks cover. Uh, why? Because they say to themselves, gentlemen, it's clear that we won't keep up economically with the West, but it's also clear that the West have given us their word in 1949, which was recent history, only a decade prior at that point, that they will allow us to occupy Berlin and East Berlin and East Germany for 40 years, counting from 1948-49. Very much like what was done to the Reich, the Third Reich in the Second World War, where a three-year window seems to have been left between Hesse's defection and D-Day, just as agreed. Gentlemen's agreements that tend to be honoured at this level, we're talking about international mafias here, basically. States are not so important to them. So 1959, the thinking is, well, we now have to avoid treading water for the remaining 30 years of this bargain. We don't just want to go backwards in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe and our Asian satellites and African satellites. We want a plan. So we're going to feign weakness, a la Sun Tzu in The Art of War, which was a favoured book by the Soviet and East German um, agents of the time who were very in embedded in British life, in churches and political parties already, or leading of thought, journalism. We're going to flood the West with uh, created problems of terrorism and drugs. Again, these are all strategies which have gone a long way back in Chinese and Russian history, particularly Chinese. And we're going to start, above all, mind-bending, narratives that there is a global problem that needs a global solution. It may be a state threat, nuclear war, and then after 1990s, it will be terrorism. And then increasingly now we are seeing the biosecurity threat. Our own bodies are, our, are the threat to us. All of these require world government. There might be another couple up their sleeves, uh, a meteor strike or, or alien invasion are the ones that are uh, banded about. These are part of the transition to the third strategy which is we are now treading water and developing ourselves um, subverting the west appearing weak at home in the eastern bloc so that we can pounce and then the fourth strategy according to Golitsyn and story begins with Gorbachev's rise in 85 just in the, the final four or five year window before the planned collapse of the Berlin Wall and the infiltration of communism into the west a story would argue largely through EU and UN bureaucracy uh, so this is where we, we lose all sense of it being nations plotting against each other, both at the time of the setting up of the Soviet Union, which is quite clearly financially and ideologically something that comes out of Germany, Britain, America more than it comes out of uh, Russia itself. And Lenin is on record many times as saying, stuff the Russians, I don't care how many millions of them die, I'm interested in the world. Trotsky was of that view too. And you have certain Soviet leaders, particularly Stalin in his later years, Putin in his later years, who basically seem to have started off in bed with a Western cabal and then at some point sticking their fingers up and saying, I'm breaking with you and I'm forming my own version of, of world government now, which is in some ways equally thuggish. I'm not, I'm not in under any illusions here. But that's it. We're now in the fourth completely globalized era of communist globalist takeover strategy. And it is about, uh, effectively an ideology that is religious anti-Christian and satanic in nature, more than it has any loyalty to a particular ethnicity. And it seems to have leapfrogged through English speaking countries, German speaking countries, Russian and Chinese territories. In some of those, it's left millions of dead bodies, tortured and, and emaciated and starved bodies. In others, the Western territories, it seems to have left millions of killed souls, even though we have great prosperity and apparent peace until recently in the West. But it is an ideology that will ruthlessly do everything it can to take the world over. And you can't bring everyone up to a high standard in world government, but you can bring everyone down to the same level of fear and want, effectively. That is the agenda. There are many arms to it that story beautifully enunciates. The strategy of criminalism, not criminality, but criminalism, using and hiding behind criminals and mafias. The strategy of democratism, shouting democracy and rule of law uh, to a great and, and exaggerated extent in order to get your placemen in the uh, in the fake plethora of parties which was a, a strategy that come, comes into the Soviet Union and the West around the time of the changeover in 1990 or so. It's a complicated area as people are telling I mean they can listen to some of Christopher Story's interviews on a channel on YouTube that names itself James Angleton in honor of perhaps one of the good men in this piece, the counterintelligence specialist in the Kennedy era at the CIA, who seems to have had better spiritual convictions than most high ranking CIA men and doesn't seem to be, have been in league with, with continuation elements of the Third Reich or the Soviet Union in any way. He was a patriotic American and Angleton believed Golitsyn. Christopher Story took note of this, and that's where this vector starts. Then Bezmenov, one of that cluster of defectors from the late 70s, when a lot of fake information started being injected as well, Bezmenov pops up in the West in the midst of all this and reinforces Golitsyn's message and also his warning that there will be fake defectors as well as a, good, a couple of good ones, and says, here's more detail for you from my perspective in the propaganda wing of the KGB, 
um, that we were fighting a war and we, we decided it was better to stop cracking skulls and firing rifles, we in the KGB and the GRU, GRU particularly interesting because it's a military body, it's a, it's a, it's a, a branch of the Soviet, the Russian army. Um, GRU uh, then takes over subversion through flooding the world with drugs, with pornography, with demoralizing messages. KGB does the same with the, the mind control uh, and mind messaging. And these are warfare techniques, but you cannot say they're the warfare of the Russian people against the West before, during or after the fall of the uh, Berlin Wall. Uh, something much deeper is going on there. You have to look at the personalities. Yeah, Alex, as always, thank you for that, because you put a tremendous amount of detail in there. I, I'm going to say for the for the audience that, that we've, we've got tonight and hopefully viewers in the following days, um, we're plung plunging in pretty deep at this straight away. Um, Alex has given a, a lot of historical and political background. Um, I'm just going to emphasize for viewers this key point that uh, what we're looking at is, is coming from um, Russian source, but we are recognizing that there is a much deeper, stronger international global hand which is driving this. So we're not in the first instance pointing a finger at Russia. We're going to be working through this uh, with a view to um, saying, do we believe something is happening? If we do, what is happening? What are the techniques being used? And then uh, later we can have some discussion, more discussion in who's really behind it. And of course, what I've forgotten to say this evening is that um, we're going to have to have several bites at this. So we'll call this episode one. We're being very relaxed in, in the chat we're going to have tonight. Um, but there is a lot to cover and we can't possibly do it in one session. We're aiming for, a, for an hour this evening and uh, we'll follow on with uh, subsequent episodes. So Christopher Story was a key man. He produced his book, The EU Collective, Enemy of Its Member States. Now that book you cannot, well you can, but it will cost you a lot of money to try and buy a hard copy. But if you search online, you can find it as a downloadable PDF. And I'll just, I'll just add that uh, it's interesting that Christopher Story went on to produce a very thick book, uh, twice as thick as the EU Collective, uh, book and that was called The New Underworld Order and I just mentioned that briefly because I think that ties in nicely with Alex's comments uh, because he, he mentioned there that that uh, the attack on Western society by drugs, prostitution, people trafficking, whatever it is, does amount to criminal uh, mafia style activity and I think it's significant that Christopher Story recognised that. Well, let's, um, let's get on to this particular table. And we'll just remind you, it's called the National Dest Destabilization Plan of the KGB GRU, based on Soviet defector intelligence. And what is it? Well, basically it lays out areas of society that it says will be attacked. Um, it uh, breaks those up, for example, into religion, education, media, culture, security services. It then says what methods are going to be applied and then it'll say it says what the intended results are. So this is a very concise little table and it says that the first stage of the plan is for 15 or 20 years and that is demoralization. You're going to be chipping away at the nation state to drag down people's morale, demoralization. After that um, it's going to go into a phase two, maybe five years of destabilization. This is where more physical effects are observed on the infrastructure of the country as well as the population. And then finally, it's really talking about revolution, but it uses a very interesting phrase because it talks about normalization. And uh, I don't know whether, Alex, you'd just like to pick up on that. This is... Uh, uh, I think this is significant. Most people would understand what you're talking about if you say, well, there's going to be a revolution. Um, but this table ends by saying, well, there's going to be, there's going to be final breakup and chaos, and that will lead to normalization. What, what does that section mean? The key to understand this, as with so much that came out of that wicked man Lenin's mouth, 
is, uh, you can find this, by the way, in Solzhenitsyn and others writing uh, at the time, Lenin was far uh, more evil in some ways than Stalin, even than Stalin, I should say, because Lenin had plans for multi-generational uh, terror in the name of goodness and the brotherhood of man, which is far more noble pseudo aims than, than Stalin ever had. Lenin uh, was a key exponent of this idea of what's often called Aesopian language, as in A-E-S-O-P-I-E-N. I-A-N, as in Aesop's fables, because of Aesop, of course, being a man who tells uh, charming stories for children about foxes and ravens and frogs. And then you think, ah, there's a hidden message here. Of course, in Aesop's case, it's a wise and salutary message. But the idea of Aesopian language is hiding your intentions in plain sight. Uh, many of those who investigate what they regard to be false flag terror attacks will talk about this, that the intention has to be broadcast, the date has to be numerologically hinted at, it's a kind of belief in gematria, according to some analysts. And so we get uh, n things being described as their opposite, which is more generally a, a, tran a trait you will see in Satanism uh, around the world in various forms, uh, calling good bad and bad good, white dark and dark white, and so on. So normalization is a, a code word here for things will be utterly chaotic as far as you and I are concerned in our right mind, but that's normalized in the cynical way that world revolutionaries would think of. You know, the, situ the scene will then have been set for world domination. Uh, in similar way, and Christopher Story was perhaps above all, he was an expert on Gorbachev and warned Mrs. Thatcher personally before and after her premiership, during and after her premiership, about Gorbachev never having uh, changed from being a Leninist, even though he spoke fluffy globalist language. And the example he pointed to was that the Gorbachev Foundation, which, uh, 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 story asserted was simply another branch of the World Communist Party, um, held a meeting when the uh, the environmental pseudo threat was being cranked up as never before in the early 90s. And the, the conference was called the State of the World Conference. But that, if you want to be linguistic, is a genitive relation between state and world. And that genitive cases have many uses. And if you analyze it properly, it's the world state conference, the conference to bring about a world state, a classic example of things meaning not quite what you think, uh, or it's getting away with having uh, an evil message broadcast, which appears to be all sweetness and light. Well, thank you for that. I'll, I'll just add a bit because uh, you weren't able to have it on screen while you gave that excellent little summary. Um, in the uh, end of this table that we're looking at and we will be showing it to our audience when we put the final video together. Uh, it talks about revolution which it says is going to be a crisis of two to six months. It says that a central revolutionary committee will be established but it then uses normalization. Um, that normalization is de facto communism and peace ensue uh, uh, um, uh, ensues and that's effective cessation of all opposition to socialism and communism. And so we better call that pacification rather than peace. Yes, yes. Okay, well, right, right, let's get on to the table then because um, uh, there will be curiosity I think now in, uh, in the audience as to what we see in this. So we're starting off with the first part of it, it's departments or areas of the targeted society. It then says ideas. And for me, I find it very interesting and highly significant that the first area of society to be targeted is religion, especially true Christianity. And so what, is, what does it say is going to be done? What is the method to be employed? Well, I'll just read this quickly. Um, so in relation to religion, it's going to be politicized, it's going to be commercialized, it's going to become scurrilous, happy, clappy events, it's going to become entertainment. It then says in the case of true Christianity, ignorance of scripture, empty ritual, women priests, um, and racism. And the intended results, we'll cover this as well, uh, di uh, diversionary claptrap, clap simony, false religion, sex, divination, magic, sorcery, charismania, death wish, spiritual desert, emptiness, and ignorance. Now, when I read that all those years ago, 
I already got a sense of major breakdown in the church uh, with a view to heading towards these sorts of uh, descriptors. But I think we're now further down the path. So first of all, Alex, what conclusion would you draw from the fact that we, we've got a plan, somebody is talking about attacking our nation state, our type of society. The first thing they go for is religion. Well, this is, if, if you want to be dispassionate about it and don't want to leap straight in and say this, is, this plan was concocted by Satanists, any group of cold-minded analytical planners who wish to bring down an enemy in what was called in that 1959 uh, all change meeting in the Soviet Union, the 81 communist parties of the world meeting, it was called a long range deception strategy. The saying that's often used is that politics is downstream of culture and culture is downstream of religion. Other ways of expressing the same th thought are uh, as priest, so people, or like priest, so people is, a, is an old fashioned phrase for this as well. That people will copy the morals that they, they see embodied in the royal family or equivalent in their nation and in the priesthood of their nation. And this is inevitable across different kinds of cultures. People will take their moral lead uh, from what's often called the sacral and sacerdotal element of society. And even if you are in a, a republic such as the United States, or dare I say it, secularist France, the presidency has in itself become a kind of religion. At least it's, there are religious level of expectations about the morality that the president must embody. He must live the virtues of the republic and be a kind of God on earth effectively, civic religion. So even whether you're talking about secularized Western societies like France, and more particularly when you're talking about a nominally Anglican state like Britain, more particularly England, which is officially Anglican, uh, you're going to have to start there. Now, Story goes a step further because he is a wise and insightful Christian, so he makes no bones about that. In both of these columns, particularly the bold column on the right, intended results, Christopher Story is, is unashamedly saying, this is my own uh, reinterpretation as a Christian Englishman of what I've been told by mostly irreligious Soviets who've defected. But he's translating it into the terms which are, I would say, not at all sensationalist. Uh, you and I have lived through this um, without any axe to grind about any fellow Christians. I would say that uh, my parents and I spent a few and rather regret regrettable years in the time when this was all happening in the mid 90s in the charismatic movement, a, a new wing of evangelicalism that was well, not begun then, but was rapidly growing then when all these things absolutely were happening, both in the Church of England and in the free churches, notably the social elite of the Church of England, and, and this has been going on since probably the 1890s, uh, Anatoly Chaitkin and others have documented it outside Britain as well. The Church of England elite, the, the respectable staid types of bishops, have been pulling the strings of the extreme uh, movements, the charismatic movements, with such things as the Toronto blessing at the end of the 20th century, or the um, uh, glossolalia uh, confusions of the 1900s, uh, both in America and in Britain and in Southern Africa. All of this, I think, quite quite clearly has been pulled from the centre as a way of shaping people's minds. And at the very least, it's a way of debasing them so that they have no higher thoughts of God or man than are necessary and that they will do, just do as they're told and have nothing higher than a profit motive and self-interest. You do have to start with a religion, even if you're not a believer. But we can go a step further, at least you and I can. So we're talking about a superhuman plan here by de definition. All right, well, um, I totally agree with that. Just to come on to uh, the demoralization methods, things that will come back to those methods uh, themselves. Um, I picked up on the fact that for true Christianity, it's talking about ignorance of scripture. And I think this has been very, very obvious within the church that uh, many churches have simply dropped um, any form of, of proper study of scriptures, discussion of scriptures, getting to know what, what scripture is really saying, that's all too difficult. So it's been replaced by church created um, soft material, but it's not, it's not directly out of the Bible and in relation to scriptures. Empty ritual is listed there, but also women priests. Now, I, I find that when we're talking on UK Column News, there's more and more coming up, which shows me that women in particular have been heavily attacked within 
um, within this um, this plan and the techniques. But of course, we have seen women coming into the church, and that has been pushed almost as a political agenda in front of our eyes. And of course, for a lot of women, this is taken as being a positive thing, that it's pushing them forward um, to equality with men. Um, so we, we've got something that's pretty sensitive happening here. But in this document, the creation of women priests is seen as a way of destroying society. On this delicate subject, Alex, what would your, be your take? Why are they so keen to get women priests into position? At the surface level, I think what one can say is, if you want to slip in a new kind of priestcraft, then the best cover for it is to use women, or in some cases, ethnic minorities and immigrants. So that if churchgoers uh, take against the creed or the social action being pushed by their new vicar or bishop, the cry can go up, you are uh, a misogynist, you are a racist, you just don't like what's being done. So you have to look at the kinds of women who, well, very well-meaning, of who, who, the kinds who became curates and vicars in the Church of England after the mid-1990s decision uh, to ordain women. And that's pretty late, actually, compared with um, some of the larger non-conformist churches in England and Wales and the, the established Church of Scotland, all taking women into uh, ministry in the 1970s and 1980s, actually. And since then, the Church of England has gone on very recently in the late 2010s to ordain women as bishops. And before you know it, there's about a dozen or 15 of them. The question is what kind of women have been promoted, not what kind have gone in en masse to be a new kind of you know, glorified social worker, sorry to, be, uh, to sound dismissive, but they're, they're very good at what they do, but it's not preaching the gospel, and they don't intend to. If you speak to them honestly, they say, I'm here to create unity and a sense of focus in the village and parish. Uh, that They'll be quite honest about that. Uh, a few think of themselves as theologians or proclaimers of the word of God, not many. But if you go to the bishops level, what kind of women have suddenly been elevated to uh, the dioceses in just speaking about England? Uh, ruthless managerialists is the answer. Ruthless managerialists. There is a longing in women. At least I think, you know, most people will who look into it a little will say at least the overwhelming majority of women, 80 percent or so. Nothing objectionable about the 20 percent who don't fit in, but about 80 percent of women wish to be family focused. That's not to the exclusion of working outside the home and hasn't been historically at all. And that is not preached in uh, historical Christianity or taught in the Bible, that women are to literally stay behind the doors of the home. Not even Paul says that when he says that women should be keepers at home, not what he means. But there is a sense, uh, and Aaron Russo in his deathbed interviews for uh, uh, talking about the, the, the CIA pushed rise of feminism says the same things. If there are certain uh, shall we say, yearnings and unfilled gaps in a woman's soul, particularly in a modern and postmodern society where she's told she's only of full value if she's going out and behaving like a man. That does create, well, you can see, you can be accused of being misogynist for even using these words, but it creates a shrillness, uh, a brittleness, uh, a harried nature in the women that make it to the top. You only have to listen to the well-adjusted women that you, lo you, you admire most in life. Um, for example, one's own mother or wife, and listen to how they respond to women who are high up in church politics or secular politics. Let me use it, phrase it that way. And you will see that well-adjusted women who are happy both in the family and in their careers that they have will shiver and say, I don't like that woman at all. They'll say it much more frankly than a man will. That is, I think, putting your finger on what's going wrong. I mean, perhaps I've opened up for you to add to those comments. Well, the easy one for me to just mention, and we, we can wait to, until it comes up at the proper time in this particular uh, document, we may get to it tonight, but I suspect not, uh, is the military, where of course there has been a dramatic and major pressure to um, draw more women into the military and also to, um, to elevate them to high rank. Um, so this is a political positive discrimination in the military in order to get the women in, and there was a particular reason for that. But um, just I just want to ensure that if we've got ladies in the audience uh, tonight, we are talking about what's being said in this document. It has talked about women priests. Um, and so we're trying to explain why women in the position of priests would be seen as a weapon to use against Western societies. 
I suppose, Brian, I should chip in and say the very next word, the last word of that section in Story's column there, the demoralization method, is racism. And this should be uh, looked at carefully. Story's not saying accusations of racism will be brought into the church. No, the Satanists and global planners, globalist planners in the churches in the West, will themselves employ the strategy of racism. Where there was no racism in the church, they will bring it in. And I think the clearest example of this is the bunch of globalist thinking um, Bible denying uh, people who've got high up in the Church of England in the West or the Anglican Communion in the Western churches, especially the United States, Canada, England and Wales, the Episcopalians in Scotland, getting together in the World Anglican Communion, uh, just to take that one example of the Anglican denomination, and year upon year making the more, more, more and more outrageous statements about the benighted blacks uh, who constitute the bulk of the World Anglican Communion these days, and their totally unacceptable views on human sexuality and family morals. Yes, yes. I'm just going to say to people that as we've, as we've gone through that section on religion, just consider that at the moment, as a result of the, the, COVID, uh, the COVID panic, um, worship effectively closed down in Christian churches with barely a murmur from the people in high office within the in the church i'll just leave people to think about that we will come back um, to uh, to do a lot more on what is happening around us we're looking at this table at the moment but just have a think about the fact this says that the power of the church was effectively to be destroyed spirituality was to be destroyed and um, we've seen amazing events over the last few months there has not been really any pushback by the established church. Um, it has simply gone along with the political agenda. Well, right. let's zoom in on the uh, word at the top right of the bold column, the intended results, that old fashioned word simony, a word with a long history in church uh, affairs. Simony is uh, the long decried sin going by, way back to the New Testament itself, Acts chapter eight, verse 20 from memory. Uh, of people saying, I would love the power. Uh, I'm a bit of a psychopath or, or um, a wizard myself, and I'd love the power of you putting a, a robe on me and calling me a bishop and giving me uh, the, you know, the, the great respect that comes with that. Can I pay you a, a hefty donation to church funds to bring that about? And in, in that verse that I mentioned, the Apostle Peter says to the man who asks this question, Simon Magus, thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought, uh, thought that the gift of God can be bought with money. And so what you're just outlining there is the effects, Brian, of a generation at least of power hungry men and women saying, I would love to write myself large, paint myself on a bigger canvas in my psychoth psychopathy or sociopathy uh, or narcissism. I fancy myself to be a great spiritual leader. It's just that I haven't been recognized as a guru on a broad enough scale yet. So if only I could get through a Church of England seminary or equivalent in another denomination, uh, I would have uh, unwanted power over, over many uh, gullible souls. So if you've got to the top of the church with that attitude, of course you don't care if there's going to be no worship. Yes, and um, I, I'm, I'm immediately coming on to thinking um, of uh, publicity where we've seen very senior members of the Church of England drinking their glass of white wine or champagne with international bankers, but we'll come back on to that um, another time. The, seconds, uh, the second area after religion to be attacked was education. And what does the document say? Well, it says that um, permissiveness and relativity is going to be brought into education and that is going to result in ignorance and zero historical knowledge. So I find it very interesting that education gets one single line but it's very very damning uh, because if, if everything becomes relative you're not teaching anything of substance. Uh, if everything is becoming permissive now, people might take that in a sexual way, which is clearly part of the ideology, I think. But it's also that anything goes, anything in the thought process, anything in material that people will look at, anything is permitted, anything and everything is, per is permitted. And therefore, at the end of the day, you have no foundation stone from which to build uh, your education from. And that leaves you with ignorance and zero historical knowledge. 
why do they want to go for education? My brain says, well, this is very much, um, uh, we, we can use a, um, a quote attributed to Hitler, which was that he, he didn't care about the present ge generation because he already owned the children. And of course, if you can control education, you control the future generation. Now, this is not just something which applies to hardcore Satanists who tend to get to the top of or uh, occupy keynotes in intelligence agencies in the West and the East. This is more generally the cynical attitude of corporatists and has been since well back into the 19th century, as best traced by the books of the recently deceased John Taylor Gatto, G-A-T-T-O, and his last work, now available, I think, as a free audio book as well, called The Underground History of American Education, brings this out. There are many other books by Gatto and taught long talks by him on YouTube, easily available. There's also the great website and book, The Deliberate Dumbing Down of America. Uh, you can find that full long PDF by searching for D-D-D-O-A, Dot PDF, and uh, that goes into this agenda as well, but not looking at the Satanist globalist end of it so much, but looking through the parallel track of why is it that the captains of industry up to the level of Rockefeller beat types uh, and the tax exempt foundations that they have, particularly stateside, why have they always said we don't want thinkers, we want workers, and at some point have openly told the schools and uh, uh, other establishments that train young people, uh, the next generation must be stupider than the last, must have a smaller worldview, must do as it's told better. So it's not even just long-term uh, globalist planners for a world state that want uh, education to be zero. It's also the more corporatist attitude. But be that as it may, the, the end result is that you tell a group of young people, you've never been freer, uh, freedom has been finally achieved, hallelujah, everyone has human rights, and you can do whatever you want and be what you want to be. And the blank look you get from the millennials, uh, at least 90% of them now, now is, but free to do what? Free to be whom? Uh, yeah. No, they haven't a clue. Almost every interview given by uh, the party leader, or taken by the, the party leader of the Scottish Family Party, goes into quite some detail on this. I think people should watch that channel and listen to him, because he's a jaded uh, teacher or former teacher uh, in Scotland who has now founded a, a worthy political party and he talks in great detail about educational philosophy and how it's failed. There's a coalition of interests that want poor education ranging from those who simply want biddable workers right through to the, those who want no sense of prior history and indeed one of the things that Golitz in Biesmenov and stories said as often as they had the opportunity uh, was that there was there was um, uh, a need in the Soviet Union to wait until everyone who could remember the Stalinist terror or who could read about it in books had died off and until there was no interest in finding out about that history anymore. And now you see the, that that period has elapsed from the 50s and it's now safe and cool again in the West to say, yeah, I'm really with Antifa, I really want communist revolution. And either they don't know that this will result in the, the starvation, torture and death of millions, or they just couldn't care less. Yeah. So I just, I, I can also add to that a, a simple level we've seen we've seen a push of young people through an educational system where the time scale got ever longer um go into school before five um, at some form of crash and you're in all the way through till 18 and then you're on to university and for many people after the university phase they're on to the phd and they come into the world in their mid twenties, and they've their 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 sole experience is this highly controlled education system. So we've lost the power of selecting people to go through a, a highly academic system because of their thought processes and intellectual capability. Um, that's all been softened, and then on on the other hand, people who had real ability to go and do more apprenticeships and hand on training and become very skilled individuals in their own right within engineering or the production of things. Um, all of that apprenticeship type training has gone and the technical colleges have gone. So we can see that what's ultimately being produced is youngsters who don't even have the ability to know what they don't know if that's not it a bit was, too complicated. 
that this is a Rumsfeldian thing, isn't it? There, there are unknown unknowns out there, which gives the brash overconfidence of a lot of that younger generation that they're quite, they're quite sure they're within their rights to kick things over metaphorically and literally and, and, and swear at all that's old. I know previous generations of rebels have done that, but not on a scale that you see now with total moral justification. And this, is, this has been done in France and Germany and the universities there since 1968 with the deliberate uh, fomenting of student revolutionary nihilist sentiment and before that in Russia in the late 19th century. Interestingly, in both cases, it happens when the young smart people realize that there isn't enough honesty and prosperity in the system to allow them uh, a full career uh, going an honest route. So that was, that's what strives them to nihilism. Let's put our, let's apply our minds to wrecking things, then at least we'll make a name for ourselves. Now, the young lady's name escapes me, but a good embodiment of this is the woman who I think about seven or eight years ago perhaps a little less, was championed by the radical wing of the US Democratic Party for the cause of making sure that there was taxpayer funded contraceptives available within easy reach to students of both sexes, or they would now say all genders, on campus. And the young lady in question was a professional student, PhD route, I think 31 when she was, you know, pretending to be penniless, a teenager type uh, student who really desperately needed her contraception for, for her and all her fellows. And if I remember, it was the acerbic commentator Mark Stein who described this 31-year-old who'd always been in education as a 25th grade primary student. And that pretty much exemplifies the thinking of yeah. these people. But of course, from their, from their 30s, they hop straight into government think tank roles in many cases now, don't they? Indeed they do. Um, and we, we could just end this particular section on education by saying, of course, within permissiveness, it's absolutely true that, that ever younger children have been targeted with, with um, sexual material, ever more explicit sexual material. So in, in addition to this greatly constrained um, education system, which is teaching them less and less and less, uh, a greater and greater proportion is to do with sexual matters. And this is, of course, designed to be um, put in their minds to cause another set of problems. So we've done religion, we've done education. The next one on the list, number three, is media. And this is very interesting. What does it say is going to be done to media? It says monopolization of news and comment, manipulation of information and thought, constant criticism and discrediting of institutions, concentration on fake, non-issues, and double standards. And what is this going to do? Well, it's going to produce political correctness, groupthink, Luciferian fog, uninformed myopia, opinions equal facts, reiteration of lies as facts, which are accepted as such by the uninformed, emergence of the common mind. That's a pretty powerful uh, sector, uh, Alex. I wasn't surprised when I read that originally because my brain at that time took it straight into Soviet propaganda tactics. And the moment you're dealing with media, of course, what are you dealing with really raw propaganda? But obviously this section was, it was felt to be very powerful. Um, by the amount of uh, of um, techniques that they're listing. We're in the middle of this, surely. We can't trust the mainstream media, whether it's newspapers or, t or television at the moment. Well, this is the true and Soviet meaning of disinformation, because media is only part of the propaganda effort as far as the, um, the globalists thinkers are, are concerned and, and at some stage that was led by the KGB but wasn't a Russian state or Russian national agenda but to any great uh, degree. In fact uh, one of the two, I think Golitsyn, uh, said that uh, actually only one-sixth of the KGB's effort was collecting intelligence, the other five-sixths was spreading false information to the enemy. Now just this week or last week on UK Colour News we treated of uh, a, a, an opinion piece by a Mr Dan Hodges formerly regarded as a kind of honest dissident, but now getting rather wobbly on some points. And he was uh, dishing out the accusation that the likes of UK Column, he didn't name us, but our circles of free media uh, were guilty or potentially guilty of disinformation. And I remember issuing the challenge to him, could he even define the word? Well, we haven't heard from him or his champions. 
but we'll go ahead and do that now because the, the definition is actually nicely given by a Romanian defector, extremely senior, by the way, um, perhaps more senior than Golitsyn or any other the proper KGB defectors from the Soviet Union proper were. Now, Ion Mihail Pacepa, the surname is spelled P-A-C-E-P-A, -E was the right-hand man of the newly installed Nicolae Ceausescu in the late 70s. And after he knew what kind of man Ceausescu was and saw that he deceived Jimmy Carter into thinking he was a man that he could do business with, Pacepa defected to the West. Again, the usual thing, the lifelong sword of Damocles, the death sentence hanging over him. In fact, uh, Carlos the Jackal, the well-known assassin, was sent after Pacepa in America. Uh, mercifully, he survived. Pacepa penned two books, and it's the latter of them called Disinformation, which gives the definition, in a nutshell, disinformation as opposed to misinformation, is deliberately using trusted sources or the shells of those institutions like the formerly trusted BBC, for example, the formerly trusted Manchester Guardian, the formerly trusted Daily Telegraph. Using that institution, uh, it, Antonio Gramsci and others would talk about the takeover or the long march through the, the cultural institutions, or uh, more modern internet memes would talk about gutting an institution and wearing its skin as a suit to demand respect. In other words, uh, I am a dead institution pretending to be alive. And so the first element of Pacepa's definition of disinformation is you uh, use a trusted source. The second is that you put nuggets of truth in what you broadcast. So di disinformation is not necessarily all false misinformation. Uh, the Allies did this for a moral noble cause, by the way, of course, when they used disinformation to broadcast um, uh, uh, you know, both true and false uh, information about their troop movements in the build up to D-Day. And the third element uh, is that you never provide primary sources. This is why I think UK Column is, is pretty much safe for as long as we're tolerated on the internet, we are safe from accusation, well-founded accusations of being a disinformation channel because we always encourage the use of primary sources. And that is what's missing in the social media hubbub these days, uh, or indeed the mainstream media hubbub, which are a lot worse for making assertions without even bothering to check the sources themselves at journalist level, let alone whether they provide links and descriptions and, and screenshots of those sources in their pieces. Uh, but media is a big area that you have spent well, upwards of 10 years now engaging with personally, Brian. What kind of calibre of journalists do you find now compared with when you first got into this game? Well, that's a pretty easy question to answer because I easily remember reading newspaper articles where clearly investigation had taken place. Journalists were writing articles where they were talking about uh, what they had looked at, what documentation they had found and considered, and uh, invariably that was uh, together with comment from, from a dialogue with the person who perhaps was the focus of the article. So the journalists spoke to the person, they listened to what they had to say, they checked documents, they cross-referenced things, and then they produced an article for the, for the, for the readership audience of the paper. But when you, when you see articles now, this is absolutely not happening. In fact, it's worse, isn't it? Because we're seeing in all the mainstream papers at the moment, articles which when you check them out have come directly from an agency of the British government. And, and this makes me, well, it doesn't make me laugh, but it makes me smile in as much as this was how the Soviet um, operated, that you were reading stuff, perhaps it was Pravda at the time, was it written by a journalist or was it straight from the government itself? We're now seeing the same model in this country. The other thing we know for a fact is that, that where journalists do show an interest in investigating things, um, they, they can produce their, their article, their report or a draft of it. And the next minute is that it's been censored by the, by the um, newspaper's editorial team. Um, and they are clearly being pressurised to follow a government line. A number of journalists have spoken to us about this, so there's no doubt, no doubt that it's happening. And of course, the other thing that's, uh, that has gone on over recent years is that um, the media, the newspapers, but, but also the BBC and, and other um, television style media have recruited ever younger people. And those youngsters previously would have come into a, 
a journalistic environment where they would have been given simple stories to follow up on. They would have worked with more experienced journalists to build up their skills before they were let loose on what would be considered um, serious and significant articles. Well, that's not happening anymore. What's happening is that you have a room full of very young uh, journalists straight out of university and they are being told that they have to produce say three or four or five stories a day and their source of material for the stories is inevitably the internet and round robin um, sources of information coming from from world press associations so you just haven't got the caliber of the people there anymore now alex i'm, I'm gonna have to say i've got an eye on the time because we're just about hitting the hour but if we summarize the media at the moment more and more people that i speak to are simply saying well i don't really trust any of it they certainly are not trusting the bbc i think the bbc has hit an all-time low the brand is damaged people say well it was on the bbc but is it true i don't know but this is beginning to spread to other outlets to the newspapers themselves um, is this just a coincidence that we've got a sudden collapse in the standard of our, our printed and uh, TV media or has something happened in line with this document we're looking at that this was a deliberate attack? Well it certainly has achieved the end result as predicted by Story in the bold column on the right and of course he is putting more editorializing in there he's quite frank about that or was when he was alive than he is in the demoralization column or the methods column his his emphasis there is the attend the intended end result is that everyone will think the same and nobody will really think clearly and know what's true from what's erroneous so it does seem that the uh, the intent or the uh, interest there would be to remove the diversity of quality brands written and spoken media brands and ultimately it's to be uh, seen in the same light as the other two sections we've covered in this uh, initial episode really because with religion and schooling and media uh, what's happened is people do not trust that which the mainstream or the state or the state aligned sector has to offer in any of these areas and of course there's a note of hope even at this early stage people might think we've been very depressing this evening <clears throat> but the note of hope is that the enemy is lazy and he only goes for keynotes and he always thinks that he can achieve the effect on the plebs by inhabiting the keynotes. So in a religion, it's get the bishops. In education, it's uh, get the educational theorists who teach the teachers. In media, it would be get the editorial team so that they can spike any story that's, a, that's an, an, an uh, unexpectedly good, uh, alert and conscientious junior journalist might produce. This is why dissenting religious organizations, independent ones, homeschooling or independent schooling in the true sense of the word and independent media in the true sense of the word funded by subscribers and well-wishers are utterly loathed by globalism they will always have smear campaigns against them because we are a decentralized enemy you know even on the, the battlefield that's always been the hardest kind of physical enemy to fight one that doesn't have an identifiable leader and hq uh, and of whom new cells will pop up as old ones are squashed it's like playing whack-a-mole uh, trying to uh, defeat that kind of decentralized principle based religion, education, or media. So th there is hope here. If people don't like the way UK Column's going, they simply s cease uh, watching and, uh, and listening to us and cease donating to us if they're doing that. Then we would die a natural and deserved death. Uh, this is not the case with state monopolies or effective state monopolies, such as the BBC, the Church of England, and the universities. And that's why the beast loves the latter of those, the, the, the monopoly category. Yeah, indeed. And I will just uh, add that um, can we still influence these journalists? Uh, yes, we can. Um, one of the things that we achieved several years ago now, but by communicating directly with the then editor of the Daily Mail, um, there followed a period of three months and then suddenly the Daily Mail printed 11 pages on the political charity Common Purpose. And was kind enough to send us a thank you letter which i think for the first time i will actually put into this uh, this video so that people can see uh, the kind response we got as a result of uh, the information we provided to the daily mail now lastly just in, in in a few minutes alex and this is so easy to do number four 
of the ideas area that were to be attacked under this uh, demoralization plan is culture. And it says the substitution of false cheap heroes and role models for inspiration and morals. And this would lead to the intended result of addictive fads, salacious and empty culture, mumbo jumbo, ape speech. Well, of course, in, in the, um, even in the dark days of COVID, if we're to believe what we're being told, um, we are seeing that the government says it has to use celebrities and football stars and TV stars in order to get the message across. So it's clear that um, these uh, um, role models and heroes are all being taken from the pop star film, TV and sport arena. This is obviously a, an important area. Yes, and um, what's going on here is the generation of fake desires, fake yearnings. Uh, it's a, a take on the old marketing strategy of creating dissatisfaction with your lot or your possession, possessions or your uh, appearance, and then saying there is a solution. You could be as superficially attractive in physical or character terms as this hero that we wave before you, who of course is an impossible construct. And uh, we will sell you ways of being more like him or her. Uh, as story says, cheap heroes and role models who take the place of, they displace inspiration and morals. So the solution is, is pretty easy there. You protect your children and yourself to the best extent you can uh, to make sure that they can be properly inspired and given morality because after you've had a satisfying meal, just as in the physical sense, so likewise in moral sense, you have no appetite for sugary knickknacks. And that, of course, is what's being put on offer. And it's often said by many cultures in many different ways that however many vices or yearnings you have, that is the number of slaves that you are. That's the number of times that you're enslaved. And I'll just reinforce that with, uh, of course, in the um, COVID crisis that we're still in the middle of, apparently, um, uh, when it came to the fact that people should remain at home, who did the World Health Organization use as the role model to be on screen to help advise people to stay in their homes? But it was Lady Gaga, not known for her medical or, or uh, intellectual knowledge and capability, but she was considered to be so important that she was clearly um, well presented, washed and scrubbed up, as I like to say, and presented to the audience to advise us to stay in our home. So we didn't use uh, a, uh, a, a world-renowned qualified doctor. We thought that Lady Gaga was the best role model to use. And that cannot have been a, an accident if it, was, if it was put in place by the World Health Organization. So I'm going to suggest we can talk about it more next time. I'm going to suggest that for Lady Gaga to be pulled out of the pot, pulled out of the hat to be put in front of the public, that decision had to be made by some very powerful internationalist people. And uh, we can focus, as I say, on that the next one. So um, we've run over the hour, so we will stop. But I'll just say, that what, what have we done this evening? We've really covered the first section of this demoralization plan. We've covered religion, education, media and culture. And um, we will move on in our next episode to structure. And if I can just show this to myself on screen, um, under stru structure, the next things to be attacked are law and order, uh, social relations, security, internal politics, and foreign relations. So there's a pretty heavy uh, mix of things there. And uh, I think people will find this very interesting. Uh, why do we think this is so important for our audience? Um, it's important because this is an attack that is difficult to see unless you know what you're looking for. But once it's been explained and you can see what it is, it becomes very, very obvious. It's, it's something hidden in plain sight and with just a point, few pointers, we can all see it. And of course, once we can see the enemy, we can fight it. When we can't see the enemy, we have great difficulty fighting. So I, I think what we're doing is dark in that we're showing some really dark stuff, Alex. 
but ultimately why are we showing it to people we're showing it to people because when they're informed as to what's happening they can deal with it any last comments from you I think people should bear in mind that uh, one of the best enunciators of this wicked plan, um, Trotsky, uh, who was so wicked that even Stalin wanted to get rid of him and famously had an ice axe buried in his skull, uh, said that our main enemy is Britain and America. And even that was code for Christian civilization, but particularly in its Anglo-Saxon form, which in some ways is superior in some ways, I say uh, carefully, is some ways is superior to other embodiments of Christianity. So people should take heart, particularly uh, those in the English speaking countries who are horrified that there's been such a long range destabilization plan set up with our Anglophone Christendom at the center of it, uh, as, the, as the center of the target, because it's, an, it's a badge of honor that we were so targeted. We were resented, and I, I stress again, it wasn't largely foreign Jews uh, putting together this plan. It was Satanists in our own midst who hated what we were, hated ourselves, as David Scott keeps pointing out with reference to Scotland, that uh, the SNP has become an anti-Scots mentality. And he also uh, often asks people, who taught you to hate your ain folk? Uh, that, that's the kind of strategy that we're up against, really, of utter despising of the British people, uh, their history, their heritage, uh, not in an ethnic sense, but in the sense of the values that they stand for. Uh, and so if we must be so loathed, it's the same when you're facing a school bully, then you can at least console yourself in the initial phases of planning your fight back by the thinking, by thinking that uh, it's me that this bully hates. I must have got something right. Yeah. Alex, thank you. Thank you very much. There's a huge amount for us to talk about uh, because the moment we've covered this plan, we're going to be looking at other material which shows us very clearly there is an attack on our minds as individuals, but also on the public mind itself, real documentation, some of it quite recent from the UK government. And if we just give people a taster as we end this, I will say just search online for the UK government document, document called Mind Space, M-I-N-D-S-P-A-C-E. That's all one word, Mind Space. Uh, if you just put it into a search engine with mindspace.pdf, you will find the document. I suggest you read it and in particular have a look at the comments at the bottom of page uh, 66, where the British government boasts it can change the way that people think and people will not even know that their thoughts and behaviours have been changed. Or if they realise something has changed, they won't understand how it was done. And as we look at the ever more criminal nature of the British government, um, we surely should be very concerned that people of that nature would have this type of um, deep psychological weapon in their hands. So have a look at Mind Space. We'll end it there. Alex, thank you very much for joining me. And uh, we will be back in part two to look at structure and the continued attack on Western democracies. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.